Um, thank you for the invitation to give a tutorial on differential categories. Now, I realize that some of you may not know who I am because I'm not always in Europe. So here's a quick hello. Um, so there's my full name, Jean-Simon Pacolomé. Je suis Québécois, je parle français. The good news is I also speak English decently, so I will be giving this talk in English. Um, I am a category theorist, and I'm currently at Macquarie University. So for those of you that know category theory, you'll know that Macquarie is well known for category theory. Um, and if you have heard of me before, then you probably know that I mostly do these things called differential categories, tangent categories, etc. And so today I've been asked to give a tutorial on those things. So if today you find this talk interesting or anything I say about differential categories, categories interesting, feel free to come chat to me either by email or in person. Or if you'd like to make the, long, the very long trip down to Australia to come visit us in Macquarie, then feel free to come uh, talk to me. And this is an invitation to graduate students, postdocs, professors. We always like having visitors down, those that are willing to make the long trip. Because it is a long trip, and I am still very tired. What? Yes? OK, so in my point of view, when I talk about the theory of differential categories, there really is four parts. There are differential categories, there are Cartesian differential categories, differential restriction categories, and tangent categories. And each four of these parts capture a different aspect of differentiation using categorical methods. So here's sort of a brief summary of what each aspect sort of captures. So differential categories do the categorical semantics of differential linear logic. But if you're coming from more a math point of view, then they really are giving you the notion of differentiation from algebra. So they're ca capturing derivations, Kähler differentials, Durham cohomology, et cetera. Cartesian differential categories, now you're moving more towards analysis than the usual notion of differential calculus, especially over the Euclidean spaces Rn. And these capture the categorical semantics of the differential lambda calculus. Differential restriction categories are like Cartesian differential categories, except now you're dealing with only partially defined smooth functions. So you're the multivariable calculus over open subsets. And recently, I will say that Cartesian, ugh, Cartesian differential categories and differential restriction categories have definitely picked up an interest, especially from the sort of people that are working in automatic differentiation and machine learning, because they found that they do provide a nice foundations for those. And then the fourth one is called tangent categories. And that's where you're dealing sort of now more with differential geometry. And, you can, and this captures the notion, as the name sort of suggests, the notion of tangent bundles on smooth manifolds. And you can also talk about algebraic geometry and also th synthetic differential geometry. So those are the four aspects. And to me, sort of the most important or the coolest thing about the theory of differential categories, we, OK, I'll repeat everything I just said. OK, well. Hello? Hello? Does this work? OK, so this is the most. OK, well, now the clicker's not working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK. So I click on the screen. OK. OK, that works now. OK, thanks. OK, so is the sound working? Because the next sentence is really important. OK, so if there's one slide to take away from my talk today, it's this one. This is probably the most important aspect of the theory of differential categories. And literally, it's that there's a map of differential categories that connects all four of these different parts together. And so what's great about this slide is that it kind of shows you how from one aspect you can construct another one of these aspects. So for example, you can start with differential categories, which is a very sort of algebraic model of differentiation, and get a much more complicated model of tangent categories, which sort of give you abstract notion, a notion of abstract smooth manifolds. So we're going to see some of these constructions today. But again, this is my favorite slide. And 
the one that I, if anything, again, if anything you take away from today, it is this slide. So in, in, today's, tutor or in today's tutorial, I'm going to be focusing on two, the two of, I'll be mainly focusing on two of these aspects, which is the ones that capture the categorical semantics of the title of this workshop or conference. So the first half will be dedicated to 10 differential categories, which capture, again, the categorical semantics of differential linear logic. And then the second half will be dedicated to Cartesian differential categories, which is the differential lambda calculus side of things. Originally, in the schedule, there was supposed to be a talk on tangent categories, but uh, the plan changed. So at the very end, I will have a slide or two both to just give you a brief summary of differential restriction categories and tangent categories. Now, this is a tutorial, and I have been given, generously given an hour and a half. So feel free, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand or interrupt me, and someone will bring you the microphone, and you can ask. All right, so let's get cracking. So differential categories, um, again, they, so they do capture the categorical semantics of differential linear logic, but if, you're more, if you come from more of a math background, you're probably more, more interested in co-differential categories, because, which is the dual notion of differential categories. So co-differential categories is really the ones that capture this idea of differentiation from commutative algebra, the notion of derivations. Now, personally, I don't like the name co-differential categories because I think it scares away the mathematicians. So sometimes I've slowly but surely been introducing these as co-algebraic differential categories and algebraic differential categories. But today, because I assume most of us come, or my, my impression is that most of the audience definitely comes from the linear logic and lambda calculus side of things, I will be going over the definition of differential categories, but I will keep co-differential categories as sort of, oop, as sort of a motivation as we go along. Uh, wrong way, this way. Um, so here are some introductory references. So there is the original paper by Bluke, Cockett, and Seeley, just called Differential Categories. And then there's a Differential Categories Revisited, which now includes myself. And then both Thomas Erard and Marcelo Fiori gave really good, also introductory papers on differential categories. So highly recommend these four papers. Okay, so here's just the definition of a differential category, and we're gonna go through it part by part. So a differential category is an additive symmetric monodal category with a differential modality, which means that it's a co-algebra modality equipped with a deriving transformation. Now, um, I should mention, so I'll start, so now let's start with the first part of the definition, which is symmetric monodal category part. Now I'm going to assume that most people do have some, a little bit of background on category theory, so I'm not gonna give the full definition of some categorical definitions, but I will give you the main intuition for some of these definitions. Okay, so essentially, a category, right, it's a thing that has objects, and you have maps between these objects, or functions between these objects. Then a monoidal category is a category where you have a tensor product, so you can take the tensor product of objects. Your favorite example of these things should be the category of vector spaces. A symmetric monoidal category, so in a monoidal category, you have your underlying category L, you have your monoidal product tensor, you're gonna have a monoidal unit, which acts as sort of the unit for the tensor product, which I call I, and the thing that makes this symmetric is that there's an isomorphism between A tensor B and B tensor A, and this is a natural isomorphism. Now, for simplicity, what's done in most differential category papers is that we work in the strict setting. So associativity of the tensor product and the unit law of the tensor product is just the identity. So instead of writing bracket A tensor B tensor C, I'm just gonna write A tensor B tensor C, no brackets. And same thing, instead of writing A tensor I, I'm just going to write A. Now, some of you probably do the categorical semantics of linear logic, and you really probably want your category to be closed or have finite products. Technically, for the definition of a differential category, you don't need either. And in fact, for the main story of differentiation, you don't actually need closed at all. So I'm not going to assume it. If you want to assume it, go ahead. If you like your world to be closed, that's perfectly fine. Same thing for products. Products will come, I will add them later, 
But for now, you don't need to assume it for the general definition. So hopefully everyone is OK with the definition of a monodal category. OK, so here are your main examples. So your first main example, like I said, should be the category of vector spaces, where your objects, so you've got for a fixed field k, your objects are vector spaces over k, and the maps are just k linear morphisms between them. But probably your other favorite example should be rel. And I think that this is the model that Guy will go into more details in his, in his, next, in his talk right after mine. But so here's just a quick version of rel. So the category has objects being sets. And maps between these, ob these objects are relations. So this is a subset. So a map from x to y in this category is a subset or a relation of x, and y, of x cross y. The monodal structure is given by the Cartesian product. So the unit is the singleton. And the tensor product is given by just the Cartesian product of sets. However, if this is the first time you're dealing with this, this is super important. This Cartesian product for the category of relations is not a categorical product. Okay, So there is a difference between the two. This is, a, this is actually a tensor product only. So these will be our two main examples and running examples that I'll give throughout the talk. So hopefully everyone is OK with these categories. OK, so now let's go to the second part, the, the other part of the definition of a differential category, which is the notion of a co-algebra modality. Now, this might be somewhat controversial, because I know that I'm speaking to many linear logicians here. But our definition of co-algebra modality does encapture some parts to interpret the bang operator from linear logic. But it does not capture the whole story. For that, you would need a monoidal co-algebra modality, which we will talk about later. But for the definition of a co-algebra, for the definition of a, just a differential category, you don't need the full notion, the full sort of bang properties of linear logic. So I don't need a monoidal co-algebra modality. So a natural question that we often get is why do you even consider co-algebra modalities that are not monoidal? Well, it turns out that there are a lot of interesting examples, especially coming from math, and we will see some of these, that are not monoidal and yet are fundamental examples of differentiation. So hopefully I will convince you that there is interest in looking at non-monoidal co-algebra modalities. And if none of, if none of those words are, um, are if, you, if you're not familiar with any of those terms, don't worry, we will go through all of them. OK, so here's what a co-algebra modality is. So if you were here from Marie's talk yesterday afternoon, then most of these, sort of the, the names of these things should be very familiar. So a co-algebra modality on a symmetric monoidal category is a functor, bang, so an endofunctor from L to L, equipped with four natural transformations. You have the digging, which goes from bang A to bang bang A, the dereliction, which goes from bang A to A, the contraction, which goes from bang A to two copies of bang A, and the weakening, which goes from bang A to no copies of bang A. And such that, well, essentially, a co-algebra modality in total can just is a co-monad. So I'm not going to give you the, the full definitions, but essentially a co-monad is a very well-known concept in category theory and essentially tells you what the axioms of the digging and the co-dereliction are. But you also have to assume that for every A, bang of A is naturally a co-commutative co-monoid. So this is, if you're coming, again, if you're coming from the math side and you don't know what a co-monoid is, just flip the diagrams of a monoid, and that's what it is. Um, but you also have to assume that the digging, P, is a co-monoid morphism. And that's the notion of a co- and that's the definition of a co-algebra modality. So it's a co-monad, where for every A, bang of A is naturally a co-monoid morphism. Any quick questions about the definition? Um, and especially if you come from the math side of thing, you're probably more, uh, or it's probably more natural to think of the dual notion, the notion of an algebra modality, which again is a monad this time, where um, each S A is a commutative monoid. So again, because in category theory we like to sort of take the dual notion of things, you we sort of flip back and forth between these two intuitions. <laughs> 
So here's this very naive intuition, which does follow some of the ideas that Marie talked about yesterday. So naively, again, sort of what Marie, like Marie did, let's assume that the monoidal unit is R. And let's assume that we have some natural notion of smooth function between A and R, and we're going to call the set of these smooth functions C infinity from A to R. Then elements of bang A, as Marie explained to us yesterday, can be thought as of distributions. So these are linear maps from the set of smooth function from A to R down to R. And for every x in A, the, there's an important distribution called the direct distribution, which just picks up a smooth function, where for every x in A, it picks up a smooth function and evaluates it at x. And so in many models of linear logic, it's enough to define what, these, what the co-algebra modality structure does on these Dirac distributions. So here's what, the, what they do. So the digging sort of tells you the, the double evaluation. So you take the Dirac distribution and the Dirac distribution. The dereliction forgets about it, forget that it is a distribution, and just gives you back the element at which it is. The co-contraction, and this is sort of the idea behind co-multiplication, is just it copies. And then the weakening just forgets, completely forgets, completely destroys. And again, because I'm trying to, I'm trying to do this for the, as most people as possible, the dual notion, algebra modalities, the way that I like to think about them, is that instead, elements of the algebra modality are actual smooth functions. And therefore, the monad structure tells you how to compose these smooth functions while the monoid structure tells you that you can multiply them together. And this will be made clearer in the next slide. So I see people taking notes, so I'll just wait a one second or two before going to examples. Good. So here's our first example, which is rel. Um, I might be stealing some of your material, but <laughs> here's, uh, here's one of our favorite examples that we're going to look at. So for every set x, let's look at the free monoid, free commutative monoid over a set x. So there's lots of ways that you can describe this. You can describe this as the free n module over x. You can describe this as the, um, uh, or sorry, not that actually is not true. You can't describe this as the free n module over x. I'm talking just monoid, sorry. Um, or you can find this as a, the set of finite multisets of x or finite bags of x. So to define, so the way you, the way that I'm going to see this today is that these multisets are functions where the support of a function, so a function from x to the natural numbers, where the support of this function is finite, and that's sort of how I'm seeing finite multisets. Um, the monoid structure on m of x is defined pointwise, so it's given by the pointwise addition, and the unit is just given by the zero map. And now for every x, there is a sort of um, Kronecker delta function, which in this case I'll use eta because I've used delta for something else, that sort of compares an element with x and gives you 1 if that element is equal to x and gives you 0 if not. And this gives you a co-algebra modality on rel, and it's given as follows. So the dereliction is the relation that relates every one of these, every element of x, oop, every element of x with this function eta. The co-promotion, sorry, the promotion relates every um, multiset of multi, it relates every multiset, finite multiset, with every other finite multiset such that the union of all the internal multisets give you that original multiset. The weakening associates the zero function with just the singleton. And then the contraction associate a multiset with a pair of multisets such that their sum is equal to f. So this is probably the, a linear logician's favorite sort of toy model. But if you're coming from math, probably your favorite model of an algebra modality. So the, my previous slide was about co-algebra modalities. This one's about an algebra modality. So everything's going to be backwards, is given by polynomial functions. And this should be expected, because what's the simplest thing that we can differentiate? or polynomials. So in VEC, a commutative monoid is what's called the commutative k-algebra. So if you're not familiar with the notions of monoids and comonoids, 
just replace it with the words algebras and co-algebras. So an algebra modal so to define an algebra modality on the category of vector spaces, you take the free symmetric algebra. So the free symmetric algebra over a vector space V is defined as taking the co-product of all the symmetrized tensor powers of V. Um, if you're not an algebraist, because we're working in with vector spaces, just take a basis, and the free symmetric algebra over V with basis set X is just the polynomial ring over that basis set X. So in particular, when you take the finite dimensional vector spaces, sim of k to the n is just literally the polynomial ring in n variables. And this gives you an algebra modality where the structure can actually be defined by polynomials. And again, I have just to emphasize things, these maps may look backwards because this is an algebra modality. So if you go back and go back in my slides and look at the definition of a co-algebra modality, that's because I've just flipped the definition around. So my maps are going in the other direction now. So the dereliction and the promotion, so the monad structure, corresponds to polynomial composition, while the monoid structure, the contraction and the weakening, corresponds to polynomial multiplication. So this, because this will be my favorite example throughout the to talk today, if anyone has any questions about this example, please do ask now. Yes? What's the difference between the two sides? PV, PV. Ah, yes, OK. So with polynomials, there really isn't a difference. But if I were to take the symmetrized tensor product, there'd be a bigger, it's just removing brackets, essentially. So you are correct that when I look at it as polynomials, there isn't a big difference, because this is a polynomial in terms of polynomials, while this is a polynomial evaluated. So in that case, it, you don't really see the difference. But if you were to play with the symmetric algebra instead, you would have a big symmetrized tensor product of symmetrized tensor products, and then you just remove the brackets. So the way do you think about promotion or digging is literally polynomial composition. Other questions? All right. So now let's move on to the other part of the definition of a differential category, which is the additive part. So additive for us essentially means that it's a symmetric monoidal category enriched over commutative monoids. This is not necessarily what's used elsewhere, but that's what we use in the differential category literature. If you don't like it, blame Robin. This was his definition. So an additive category is just a category where essentially every HOM set is a commutative monoid. So that means that I, where I'm talking about commutative monoid written additively. So that means that I can add maps together and I have zero maps and composition preserves the addition on both sides. Keep that in mind because later in the talk, we're going to lose that property. Then a symmetric, an additive symmetric monoid category is just a symmetric monoid category that's additive, but where the tensor product also preserves the additive structure. Now, because most of my audience does come from computer scientists, not assuming negatives is perfectly fine and a reasonable thing to do. If you're coming from more from a math background, note that this definition does not involve negatives. So important to keep in mind. Also important to keep in mind, and this is where the, the difference between additive categories and other references might be, we do not assume byproducts yet. Okay, so this is a de this is a product free definition. So your two main your main examples of additive symmetric monoidal categories should be VEC and REL. So again, VEC it's an additive symmetric monoidal category with the sort of with the canonical the, the the usual notion of addition. So it's the sum of linear transformations. In REL, the sum of relations is given by excuse me. The sum of addition, the sum of relations, is given by their union. And you'll note that here, the here addition is idempotent. So r plus r equals r. And the zero map is given by the subsets. Now, in my previous slide, I said we didn't assume byproducts. But yes, in these two examples, one way to get the additive enrichment is from byproducts, which is 
a perfectly fine thing to do. But again, in the definition of a differential category, products are not necessary. Okay, so now we finally get to the differential part of the definition, which is the differential modality. So this is a co-algebra modality equipped with a deriving transformation. So what is that? So as I just said, a differential modality is a co-algebra modality equipped with a deriving transformation, which is a natural transformation from bang A, tensor A, to bang A. And this has to satisfy five axioms based on the basic identities from differential calculus. So if you're coming at this from a co-algebra modality uh, point of view, the intuition on Dirac distributions is that it's going to the deriving transformation takes a Dirac distribution and a point and gives you the distribution, which is given by differentiating a smooth function at point x in direction y. If you're coming at this from the math, more math side of thing, the algebra modality side of things, the deriving transformation, which is now a map going in the opposite direction from SA to SA tensor A, is an actual derivation from commutative algebra. Yes? Is that a question? No. Is an actual notion, the usual notion of a derivation. And so from that point of view, the five axioms that a deriving transformation is going to have to satisfy is the constant rule, which says that the derivative of a constant function is 0, the product rule, which tells you how to derive the multiplication of functions, the linear rule, which tells you that the derivative of x is equal to 1, the chain rule, which is the the formula for the differentiation of composition of functions, and then the interchange rule, which I think some people also call the Schwartz rule, which essentially tells you if you differentiate with respect to x, then y is the same thing as doing y, differentiate with respect to y, then x. And we will, like, this is just the idea, so I will be giving the full definitions. But before I do that, uh, I think it might be good to have maybe some, uh, some actual examples of the driving transformation to get a better grasp of this. So here are our main examples of deriving transformations. In the category of sets and relations, where my co modality was given by finite multisets, uh, the deriving transformation, right, it's going to take a finite multiset and a point and associate it to the, that finite multiset summed with that Kronecker delta function. If you're thinking of this as bags, it's going to take a bag and an element and just add the element into the bag. Easy enough. For polynomials, it really is just polynomial differentiation. So if you take a vector space V with a multiset X, uh, sorry, a basis set X, then the deriving transformation, which goes from the polynomial ring to polynomial ring tensor V, is given by the sum of the partial derivatives of the polynomial. And this idea of taking the sum of the partial derivatives is sort of the canonical way of defining differentiation throughout differential categories, Cartesian differential categories, tangent categories, etc. Everyone okay with these examples? Yes? Good. See noddings? Good. All right, so now let's go through the axioms. So the first axiom, remember, was the constant rule, which says that if you derive a constant function, it should be equal to 0. This is captured using the weakening rule. So it essentially says that if you compose the deriving transformation of the weakening rule, it's equal to 0. Now, if you're not comfortable with co-monoids and co-monads, and you're more on the math side of things, all my diagrams I'm going to write here today read them backwards then you can think of this as inserting the unit and then deriving it. So for, poly, for my polynomial example, the unit or the weakening is given by just giving you a constant polynomial function. And that's literally saying that the partial derivative of the constant function is 0. Therefore, it's equal to 0. Yes. Yes, in the, in the example, this is the, mo the algebra modality, so backwards. OK, so the definition I'm giving in terms of bang, 
but the example that I'm using is in terms of sim A, which is S A, yes. It's just, I find that these examples are very clear using polynomials, so I'm using that as my running example. Okay, the product rule, and this is probably where reading it backwards is the most useful. This is literally the diagram of, of a derivation from commutative algebra. So if you read this, it is saying that the derivative of the contraction, which is multiplication in our polynomial example, is given by the sum of the derivative times the other thing plus the other derivatives times the other thing. So in polynomial examples, it is literally the usual notion of the product rule, also known as the Leibniz rule. Um, all right. And don't worry, the slides are on the website, so don't feel like you have to write really fast these axioms. Okay, the linear rule is just, as I said, it's the axiom that says that the derivative of x is equal to 1. So the dereliction that, as Marie explained to, yes, us, to us to us yesterday, is capturing the notion of linear maps. So the usual, the der is essentially saying that the, der the, that the derivation of a linear map should essentially be itself evaluated at the vector argument. So for polynomials, the dereliction sort of gives you the, I guess, projection or the one variable monomials. And it's saying that the derivative of these things is just equal to one tensor xj. Now the chain rule is a little, is a little more complicated, right? Because if you remember from calculus, the chain rule says that if you derive a composite of functions, you take the derivative of the outer composite evaluated at the inner composite multiplied by the derivative of the inner composite. And that's a, this is exactly what this diagram is saying. And again, if you're more of a math, from the math side of things, read the diagram backwards. And that's exactly what it's saying. And so here I, I've captured it with a polynomial, with a polynomial in one variable and a polynomial in multiple variables. But this model works for vector spaces of any dimension and polynomials of multiple variables, so I can have a more general notion, I can have the more general chain rule as well here. And lastly, the last axiom, which to be, because this is a tutorial, I do, I should explain. If you go to look at the original paper on differential categories, this axiom wasn't there. It only came apparent that this axiom was important when we'll talk about Cartesian differential categories. So, but nowadays, this is now included in the definition of a differential category. So this is the axiom that essentially says, again, the, the order of differentiation, when you're differentiating the same function over the same, over the same sort of vector of variables, does not matter. So the way this is captured is essentially saying that, mm, yes, is essentially saying by twisting these two linear arguments A, it, your end result doesn't matter. Or the, end, the twisting doesn't affect the end result. And so there, yes. And so there you go. So that is the definition of a differential category. Again, it is an additive symmetric nodal category with a differential modality, which is a co-algebra modality with a deriving transformation. So before I move on to monoidal co-algebra modalities, does anyone have any questions about the definition? Can you just the axioms? Yes, so the axioms are, so the axioms are the constant rule, the product rule, the linear rule, the chain rule, and the interchange rule, which I think some other people call the Schwartz rule in other papers as well. OK, so now we're going to sort of get closer to differential linear logic. And we're going to get closer to some of the things that Marie talked about yesterday. Because Marie talked about co-dereliction. She never said the word deriving transformation. So now we're going to get to that. And to talk about co-dereliction, we have to talk about monoidal co-algebra modalities. Yes? You can shout. Yes? Yes? 
That is, it is the, yes, the total directional derivative. And why do we do that? It's to capture multivariable differentiation. So, um, Wait, wait, he's going to bring you the microphone. Can, can't you, for example, define the gradient inst instead of defining the total, oh, yes. the, the total you, derivative? Um, I've, I have not seen that done for differential categories and differential linear logic, yeah. but it has been done for Cartesian differential categories. Oh. So my assumption is yes, you could definitely do it for differential linear logic. It just hasn't been done, okay. I guess. OK, thanks. But I, I, uh, but I will say, that the, the gradient has a very finite dimensional flavor to it, while the total derivative definitely works in infinite dimensional in the infinite dimensional version, which is why, so there's no problem there. So it's yes, we can talk about it more later, but good question. Okay, so now let's talk about code elections. But before that, I have to tell you what a monoidal quadrant modality is, and here's the definition. So a monoidal coaudra modality is a coaudra modality which now comes equipped with two extra structural maps. A natural transformation from bang A tensor bang B to bang A tensor B. And notice my brackets. It is bang of A tensor B. And another structural map which goes from the unit to bang of the unit. Such that, well essentially wherever you see the, such that you put mon symmetric monoidal in front of all, the de all your structural maps. So bang has to be a symmetric monoidal functor, so it has to you know, behave well with the tensor monoidal structure. The comonad has to be monoidal transformations, so this is another way to say that this is a, monoidal, a symmetric monoidal comonad. Um, C and W have to be monoidal transformations. Excuse me. And if you were to write down the diagrams of what the monoidal transformations are for the contraction and weakening, you'll realize that that's another way of saying that these monoidal structural maps mu and mu i are comonoid morphisms. And then the last part is that contraction and weakening are also bang coalgebra modality, uh, bang coalgebras, which is the notion of a coalgebra for a comonad. Um, I'm happy to give you references for all the diagrams, but there's a bit, there are many of them, so I won't go over all of them. So hopefully, for now, this definition is okay. Now, again, for those of you that are familiar with the categorical semantics of linear logic, there are many ways of defining, of equivalently defining a monoidal coalgebra modality. Uh, one way is to say that it's a comonad such that the tensor product of the base category becomes an actual categorical product in the co eilenberg mohr category, and this is captured by a linear nonlinear adjunction. And I don't see. I know he's speaking later in the week, but Paul André has a really good set of notes called the Categorical Semantics of Linear Logic. So if you're interested in all the equivalent ways that you can define a monoidal quadruple modality, this is a reference that. Or our paper, we go we review it as well in differential categories revisited. We do the whole thing from scratch. Now, when we have finite products, and this is probably the version that most people are familiar with. There is yet another way to equivalently define monoidal coalgebra modalities. And this is, by what's, this is by the famous Seeley isomorphisms. So for a category with finite products, I'm going to define categorical products. This is where they come in. I'm going to define the binary product as just times and my terminal object as top with projection with my two projection maps. Then a storage modality is a coalgebra modality such that these canonical maps that I can define for any coalgebra modality are an isomorphism. So now I have that bang A times B is isomorphic to bang A tensor bang B. And these are called the Seeley isomorphisms. And it turns out that for a category with finite products, for a symmetric monoidal category with finite products, to give a storage modality is the same thing as giving a monoidal coalgebra modality. So to recap, from these Seeley isomorphisms, I can build these two maps mu. And from these maps mu, I can build the inverses of these canonical maps. So pick, pick your poison, whichever version you like better. And that's the definition of a monoidal coalgebra modality. Um, any questions? Yes? So this definition means product? Yes, for the. No, so 
The definition of a storage modality involves products. You have to have them to build these maps. This definition does not involve products. So you can have a monoidal, you can have a category without products and still have a monoidal quadra modality. But if you have products, they're the same definition. Okay, but for differential categories, we don't only work in a symmetric monoidal category, we work in an additive symmetric monoidal category. And it turns out, and this was the most important part of our differential categories revisited paper, that there is yet another equivalent way to define a monoidal quadra modality, which we called an additive bialgebra modality. So these are where the two other maps, uh, the two other rules that Marie talked about for differential, the first of the rules that Marie talked about, co-contraction and co-weakening come in. So an additive bialgebra modality is a co-algebra co modality where it comes equipped with two other natural transformations, one going from bang A, tensor bang A to bang A, and one going from I to bang A, such that, well, the co-contraction really is just the, multipli is just the multiplication, so it makes bang of A a monoid. And actually, it makes bang of A a bimonoid, or a bialgebra, if you will. And some other compatibility relations that are quite natural. So the idea is, and sort of Marie talked about this yesterday, on direct distributions, the co-contraction is just gives you back the sum, and the co-weakening gives you the zero, the Dirac at zero. And so one of the main theorems in our differential categories revisited paper is that for an additive symmetric monoidal category, monoidal coalgebra modalities and additive bialgebra modalities are the same thing. Are, they are the same thing. So from the contraction, co-contraction and co-weakening, I can build the maps mu, and from the maps mu, I can build the contraction, uh, the co-contraction and co-weakening. Now, if you had products on the Celi isomorphisms, then you could also, you would also get an equivalent definition. And in that case, the co-contraction and co-weakening comes from the fact that your product for an, in the additive setting is in fact a byproduct. I won't go over the full definition of byproducts, but that's where it's coming from. So the reason why this is important is because to define co-dereliction, co-contraction and co-weakening do play a role in the axioms. So I'm just going to give you the definition of co-dereliction right now. So because, as the name suggests, a co-dereliction should be a, map, a natural transformation of dual type as the dereliction. So it's going from A to bang A. And the way that you should think about this, and I'll review this in the next slide, is that Marie explained to us that dereliction takes a linear thing and forgets and gives you a nonlinear thing by forgetting. Co-dereliction does the opposite. It takes a, a nonlinear thing to a linear thing. It linearizes. And this is done using differentiation. And so the co-dereliction satisfies five axioms. And they're the same, they're analogs of the five axioms of a deriving transformation. They are the constant rule, the product rule, the linear rule, the alternative chain rule, and the monoidal rule. And the alternative chain rule is, comes from Marcelo's original paper, or his paper. And Robin, Rick, and Robert, in their paper, have the full chain rule in, the de in, their, de in their definition. But it turns out that this is an equivalent axiomatization of a co-dereliction. Now, for those of you that have already read our paper, you might point and say, hold on, some of these axioms are redundant. Yes, the constant rule and the product rule are actually redundant. You only need the linear rule, alternative chain rule, and monoidal rule to get a full definition. But for completion, and for what's on the next slide, it's, I would, it's better to show you these five rules. OK, so hopefully everyone was paying attention to Marie's talk yesterday, because she explained to us that coder eviction was differentiation, differentiation at point zero. And this is captured by the, by the bijective correspondence between co-derelictions and deriving transformations. Um, and this is the main theorem of our paper, Differential Category Revisited, which says that for a monoidal coalgebra modality, or an additive bialgebra modality, there is a bijective correspondence between co-dereliction and deriving transformation. So it doesn't, so you can define differentiation in both ways. So to go from a deriving transformation to a co-dereliction, what you do is you evaluate your, your differential at zero. 
So this is, this is where that idea, that code dereliction is indeed differentiation at zero. To go from code dereliction to a deriving transformation, that's where you use the co-contraction. And these constructions are inverses of each other. Uh, yeah. Questions? All right, so here are the examples of code relations. So both of the models that I've given so far are monoidal co-algebra modalities. So for rel, the code relation associates an element to the Kronecker delta function. And for vector spaces, it's the map going the other way. So it's the code relation goes from S of V to V, or in this case, the polynomial ring down to V. And it's the one that essentially kills every, all the, anything of degree non one. So it, it will extract degree one. And if you think about that long enough, you realize that, ah, that is for a polynomial, that's taking the polynomial, differentiating it, and then evaluating at zero. So hopefully everyone's okay with those examples. So one example that I think I, think I should advertise uh, to my fellow linear logician, categorical linear logicians, is that actually there's a really important example of class of examples of co-algebra modalities, and these are called free exponential modalities. These are, these are the ones where bang of A is not just a co-monoid, but the co-free co-commutative co-monoid. So it has it satisfies this extra universal property. And for those of you that are familiar with linear logic terms, this is what in this case we would call this a Lafont category. Um, and it turns out that for every free exponential modality on an additive symmetric monoidal category with byproducts um, has a code dereliction. And you can show this using the, universal prop the, using the universal property. So in other words, every, Laf every additive Lafont category is a differential category. Um, and both of our examples, both of our examples so far are free exponential modalities and they are the the coder elections that I gave you are the ones from the universal property. Another thing that I'd like to advertise is this result that I don't think has been published anywhere, but Marie and I worked out, is that actually code error elections are unique. There is at most one code error election for every monoidal co algebra modality. Now this was known for free exponential modalities, but it turns out the proof also works for an arbitrary one which I think is quite neat. And I talked about this at one of the uh, Canadian Category Theory Conferences, Oktoberfest, which is quite fun. Um, but this will lead me to my next advertisement. There's an open problem. Uh, and it's driving me crazy. For a non monoidal co modality, deriving, I don't know if deriving transformations are unique or not. So, for monoidal ones, for ones that have the Celi isomorphisms or so far, deriving transformations are equivalent to co derelictions, so they're unique. For the non case, I don't know. So it's an open question. I've been struggling with this for many years. Please help. Um, so if you have any ideas, let me know. So either I have to prove it or I have to find a counterexample. And I keep flip flopping between which one it should be. I'm convinced that it's probably not true, and I'd like a counterexample. I just don't have one. Okay, so other examples of differential categories. So the first one is, an, is probably the example of a non monoidal co algebra modality, but is still one of the most important differential categories that we have. So there's another differential category structure on VEC, or VEC op rather, and it's given by C infinity rings. So instead of differentiating polynomials, we're going to differentiate smooth functions. So a C infinity ring is just an, a generalization of polynomial rings, where instead you replace polynomial with smooth functions. And for every vector space, there's a free C infinity ring given by S infinity of V. And in particular for the finite dimensional ones, it's just the usual set of smooth functions of Rn. And this has a deriving transformation, which is again given by the sum of the partial derivatives. And this is a, an example, a non monoidal co modality. Then, Probably other examples of differential categories include finiteness spaces or Couture spaces. 
And an example that Marie sort of talked about yesterday as well, which is the convenient vector space model. So there's lots of examples of differential categories out there in the literature. OK, so what can you do with differential categories? So this is, this is more what you can do with co-differential categories, so more on the math side of things. But I think it's quite neat to advertise. You can actually talk about the usual notion of derivations and Kähler differentials from algebra. You can talk about Hochschild com complexes, Durham cohomology, same thing. I will like to ad I, I advertise this thesis a lot. Keith O'Neill was Rick Lutz's student. I think this thesis is a gold mine. Has lots of great ideas that no one's ever followed up on. So if you want to follow up on something, go read Keith's thesis. It's great. And then you can also talk about differential algebras, which is what I did, and which is generalizing derivations to a more another notion of derivation. OK, so now we're going to slowly get to the second part, which is talking about Cartesian differential categories. And the way we do that is via the notion of smooth maps from a differential category. So for people in linear logic, this should be quite natural. It's what you're expecting to come next. So every differential category has a notion of smooth maps. A smooth map from A to B is just a Cochleisley map. So it's a map from bang A to B. Now, again, the, the next slide of uh, the next example is probably more for people that's coming from math. Because for a long time, I, who come from a math background, did not understand this concept of why bang A to B should be thought of as a smooth function. So hopefully this, this next example will explain that. So let's consider our C infinity ring example, where bang Rn is the smooth functions from Rn. Good? OK. So take a smooth function from Rn to R. That is an element of my C infinity of Rn. But elements for vector spaces correspond to linear functions from R to C infinity of Rn. It's the one that picks out that element. Do the category theory thing and flip everything by looking at, oh, geez by looking at the opposite category. So now you have a map from C infinity Rn to R and Vec op. And now replace C infinity of Rn with just bang of Rn, and there you go. You have, you hopefully, you can clearly see now the correspondence between the notion of smooth functions and maps from bang Rn to R. And of course, this works where you replace Rn and R with A and B. So hopefully everyone, uh, that was a good example for everyone to follow. So the rest of the co modality structure it te essentially tells you what kind of operations you can do on the smooth maps. So the, the weakening tells you that you have constant smooth maps. The contraction tells you that you can take the product of smooth maps. The dereliction tells you that you have the linear maps, are smooth maps. And the digging tells you, the Cochleisley co composition tells you that that is the composition of smooth functions. When you have a deriving transformation, you can also talk about the differential of smooth maps by doing the same thing that you did with the other maps and just precomposing the smooth map by the deriving transformation. And you can make that, um, and you can make that precise by saying that the Cochleisley category is a Cartesian differential category. So before I move on to Cartesian differential categories, does anyone have any questions about, I guess, the first and larger part of the talk? All right. So now let's move on to this part, which is Cartesian differential categories, which is the categorical semantics of the differential lambda calculus, but also gives you the categorical foundation of differential cal calculus over Euclidean spaces. Um, so here are some introductory references. Um, so here's the definition, and I'll do the same thing. I'll break it down piece by piece. So our Cartesian differential category is a Cartesian left additive category with a differential combinator. So let's look at the first part. So a Cartesian left additive category is sort of the same idea. It's a category with, a, with an additive structure, but with some caveats. So here's the definition. 
a left additive category. And if you're a fancy category theorist, you'll say that it's a skew enriched over commutative monoids. But I assume most of you aren't fancy category theorists. So it's just a category where each hump sets a uh, commutative monoid. But this time, only pre-composition preserves the additive structure. So uh, sorry. Yes, only pre-composition preserves the additive structure. So when you take f plus g composed with x, then you can split it up. And you, when you compose, post compose anything by 0, you get 0. And only certain maps will preserve additive structure by post composing by them. And we're going to call these additive maps. Then a Cartesian left additive category is a left additive category with finite products such that projections are additive. So the favorite example that you should have in mind is the category of polynomials. Because famously, x squared is a non-additive function, right? Because x plus y squared is not equal to x squared plus y squared. So we want functions, we want to be able to take the sum of smooth functions, but also functions that don't preserve the addition. So your favorite example should be the, I guess, what we call the Levere theory of polynomials, which is the category where the objects are the natural numbers, and the maps are tuples of polynomials. The same sort of example is you take the category of smooth functions between the Euclidean, vector space, the, between the Euclidean spaces. And again, uh, this is a category where you can take the sum of smooth functions, but, not where, not, but one where not every smooth function preserves the sum. And in the category where, where every function does preserve the sum, this is precisely a category with finite byproducts. So for example, VEC is a Cartesian left additive category, but where everything is additive. OK, so now we get to the differential part of the definition. So what is a differential combinator? So a differential combinator is a le on a Cartesian left additive category is an operator D which takes in a function from a to b and spits out a function from a cross a to b. And again, and it's going to satisfy seven axioms. But before I give those seven axioms, let me give you some examples to sort of um, help go through the axioms. So let's look at the category of smooth functions. So you were asking about gradients and Jacobians. This is where it's going to come in. So smooth is a Cartesian differential category where the differential combinator is again given by the total directional derivative, which is just the sum of the partial derivatives. So one way to define this is using the Jacobian matrix. You take a smooth function from Rn to Rm, which is in fact a tuple of smooth functions. Then you build its, Jacobi, its uh, Jacobian matrix, which is where each coefficient is one of the partial derivatives of the smooth functions of your function. Then the directional derivative of f evaluated at x and y is the Jacobian matrix evaluated at the point in the first argument x dot product with y. And if you expand that out, you precisely get back that it's the tuple of the partial derivatives of each of the smooth functions little fi. And so in particular, for a smooth function from rn to r, you get back that it is precisely the sum of partial derivatives. So this is arguably the canonical example of a Cartesian differential category. So any questions, because this is the example that we're going to use. So any questions about it? Awesome. So the other two examples that I had on the board are finite byproducts and polynomials. So for finite byproducts, you can always define a differential combinator by just taking your smooth, by taking your function a to b and just projecting out the second component and then doing f. Now you may think, oh, well, that kind of looks like a trivial example. Yes, I agree. But it turns out that this example is actually quite important. In some way, it's initial, and it's sort of the building block of other Cartesian differential structures. And then the polynomial example also works, where it's the same sort of deal. You take the tuple of partial derivatives of the polynomials. OK. So now we're going to go through and look at the seven axioms of a differential combinator. And to help us, there is a sort of a term calculus notation that we use for differential in Cartesian differential categories. And it's borrowed from the notation that is used for smooth functions. So we're using this dot product as really the same sort of dot product from differential calculus. 
And this term, this, this term logic is also quite useful for definitions and complicated proofs. Like for example, the Fata Bruno formula, if ever you try to tackle that. Okay, so the first axiom is essentially the additivity, um, the additivity of the combinator, which says that the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. So hopefully that's a straightforward axiom that everyone should be comfortable with. The second axiom is additivity in the second argument. So remember that a derivative, the total derivative, takes a point and a vector argument. The reason why we don't say it takes in two points is because the second argument is linear. It's additive in that vector argument. So the sum, so it's, so the sum, if I take a sum in the second component, it's equal to the sum of each component. And if I, in particular, if I put zero in the second component, it's equal to zero. Oh, okay, well, here's the next slide. <laughs> Um, the third axiom tells you essentially what the derivative of identities and projections are. They're essentially projections. The fourth component is the pairing operation. It's the pairing axiom, which tells you that the derivative of a pair is the pair of the derivatives. And you see this in our smooth functions example. If you go coordinate-wise on the smooth function, you'll realize that I just took the partial derivatives of each of the coordinates. Arguably, the most important axiom of a Cartesian differential category is the chain rule, which tells you how, because composition is arguably the most important thing in category theory, so you, there should be an axiom that says how do I define differentiation of composition, and it's written as so. Very important, the chain rule normally when you learn in calculus involves multiplication. In higher orders, in higher degree variables, you don't necessarily have this multiplication. And yet, you still have the chain rule. And it's expressed by the fact that the derivative has two arguments. OK, the last two arguments are a little mysterious at first. We're going to revisit them. But essentially, they tell you how to what the, the second order derivative is. So the second order derivative takes in four arguments. So you have a cross a cross a cross a to b. So the first argument, so the first ax or the sixth axiom is the linearity in the second argument. I will come back to this, but here's what it says. It essentially says that if you put zero, if you put zero in the middle two arguments, you get back the first derivative. I will come back to this. I, I know this is mysterious, but I will come back to this. The second argument is the symmetry rule, which is that rule that says that it doesn't matter which order you define differentiation. But for now, it's defined by saying that you can swap the middle two arguments for your derivative. And again, I will come back to these two axioms. Don't worry if they look mysterious. OK, so once again, here's what the definition of a Cartesian differential category. It is a Cartesian left additive category with a differential combinator. So before we give more examples of these things, let's see what we can do with a, diff with a Cartesian differential category. So the first thing that we can do is actually talk about partial derivatives. So if I have a function of type a cross b to c, I'd like to take the derivative with respect to a while keeping b constant. And the way you do this is literally by inserting zeros. So if I take the full derivative, I get a map from a cross b cross a cross b to c. And to take the partial derivative, I just put zeros in that second a and b. So the partial derivative of f in a, where you get b constant, is you just insert a 0 in where the b should have been. And we are going to introduce some new notation, which instead of writing d of f deriv derived in terms of x and y, you just take the derivative, you just take f to be constant, and then we define the partial derivatives like so. So the b now appears in sort of in the differential operator because it's acting as a constant. And same sort of thing that you can do to define the partial derivative of b in terms of b, you put a 0 in the a argument. And more generally, you can do this with maps not just of two inputs, but n inputs, and so on and so forth. So 
If I go back and look at CD7, CD7, which is the last axiom with the symmetry rule, literally tells us that if you derive with respect to x, then derive with respect to y, is the same thing as doing y than x. So this axiom is better understood using partial derivatives. The second axiom, additivity in the second argument, actually tells us that the sum of a function in multiple variables, sorry, that the derivative of a function in multiple variables is equal to the sum of the partial derivatives. So we're recapturing that idea of why we are differential combinator is the sum of partial derivatives. And so here's the proof using the term logic. It's a fun little exercise, but I'll leave it to you guys to look at that later. OK, another important thing that we can talk about in a Cartesian differential category is the notion of linear maps. And this notion of linear is directly linked with differentiation. So a linear map is a map whose derivative is essentially just f. So it's a map whose derivative is f evaluated in the vector argument. In a category with finite byproducts, every map is linear by definition. In the category of polynomials, uh, a, a polynomial is linear if it's a, just a sum of things of degree 1. And for smooth functions, it turns out that linear in the differential sense corresponds to linear in the usual classical R linear sense. And this makes sense because in general, in an additive, in a Cartesian differential category, linear, every linear map is additive. The converse is not necessarily true. It is true for many examples, but in a general Cartesian differential category, you can't say that additive implies linear. However, the third axiom, CD3, tells you that identity maps and projection maps are linear. The same thing that you can do with partial derivative, you can also define what it means to be linear with respect to the partial derivative, or linear in a variable. So being linear in a variable is that when you take the partial derivative in b, for example, then you just get back f. You're a function evaluated in the vector argument of the partial derivative. And so the sixth axiom, the linear in the second argument axiom, is just saying that for any function, its derivative is linear in its second argument. So I rewrote the sixth axiom using partial derivatives as so. And again, this makes sense, because if you look at our smooth function example, my total derivative is linear in the vector point, in the vector argument, the second argument. Any questions about linearity? Awesome. And we're doing great time. OK, so obviously a lot of people here work, have worked on the differential calculus and the lambda calculus. So probably you're more interested in the case when your category is Cartesian closed. So, this is, so there is a nice notion of a Cartesian closed differential category. So it's a Cartesian closed category, which means that I have internal Hans and an evaluation map. And essentially, a Cartesian differential category is one where the evaluation map is linear in the internal Hom argument, so linear in its first argument here. Um, there are many, f I, think, I think you might have been the first one to show, Julio, that this is equivalent to saying that the, deriv the equivalent to saying that the derivative is of a curry of a map is equal to the curry of the partial derivative. So again, pick your poison of which definition you prefer, but they're equivalent. And so um, a Cartesian closed differential category essentially is the categorical semantics of the differential lambda calculus. Um, and here's a bunch of results that go more into that. I won't go into that today, but if you're curious, definitely go see. I highly, Julio's paper, 2012, great paper. Highly encourage you to all go check it out. That's where he also talks about Taylor expansion in a Cartesian differential category if you're interested. OK. So what are some other examples? So the first one, Brenda's going to talk about it on Thursday. Um, it's a great example. I think that this was one of the, it, was, it really was groundbreaking because it took Cartesian differential categories in a completely, in a completely new direction. So it's a very exciting example. So when they came up with this, it was very exciting for us. So definitely come to Brenda's talk on Thursday. But there, 
so that's one important example. Another example is that there's a construction that Cockett and Seeley came up called the Fada Bruno construction, which is the <clears throat> which gives you a toe-free Cartesian differential category. Now, if you're a category theorist, you may think there are sort of theorems that tell you that there is a free construction of differential of Cartesian differential categories, but it does not come for free that there's a co-free one. And that's what the Fodder Bruno construction is. Now, let's get to another important source of a Cartesian differential category, which now relates to the first part of the talk, which is this, again, most important slide of the talk. And we're going to look at this arrow here that goes from differential categories to Cartesian differential categories by the, via the Coclisley construction. So let's take a differential category L with co differential modality bang, and let's assume we have finite pro products, which are finite byproducts, but that's not important. Let's look at its Coclisley category, which again is the category of smooth functions in my differential category. So we can make this into a category as follows. Maps in the Coclisley category from A to B are maps from bang A to B. And I'm going to use interpretation brackets to help sort of navigate this definition. So the identity in the, so because I have a category, I have to tell you what the identity and composition is. The identity in the Coclisley category is just the dereliction, and the composition involves the digging. So how can we make the Coclisley category into a Cartesian differential category? So the first thing I have to tell you is what the product structure is. So because my base category has a product structure, it is a result in category theory that if the base category has products, the Coclisley category has products. And here's how it's done. The product on objects is just A times B, and the projection maps is just the projections of the base followed by the dereliction. OK, what's the other thing? I have to tell you what the additive structure is. So the base category is an additive symmetric monoda category, so it has addition. So I can define the sum of maps to be just the sum of the smooth functions, and the zero map is just the zero of the base category. However, this is important. In a differential category, composition preserved addition on both sides. I know that was like an hour ago, but hopefully everyone remembers this. For a Cartesian left additive category, composition only preserved it on one side. This is because of the Coclisley composition. You lose that preserve, the fact that it preserves addition on both sides. Okay, so the last thing I have to tell you is what's the deriving trans, or what the differential combinator is. And earlier, I told you, you, der, you multiply by the differential, the deriving transformation. What is the problem with this? Then one C. It is not a Coclisley map. A Coclisley map goes from bang of something to something else. This is bang A tensor A. That tensor A is outside of my functor. So what do I do? Well, you just use the other structures of your, um, you use the, the other maps in your coalgebra modality. So you start, so you need to get a map from, a smooth map from bang A cross A to B. So you take the contraction, then you do the projection, each projection on both sides. You do the direction on only the second component, and then you do the deriving transformation. And I'm sorry, that's a typo. That should be the deriving transformation, not little d. And so here's the theorem. The Coclisley category of a differential category with finite products is a Cartesian left additive, is a Cartesian differential category. And you'll notice I do not need a monoidal coalgebra modality for this to work. So, but speaking of, every Coclisley map of the form bang A to A using the dereliction followed by B is a linear map in the differential sense in the Coclisley category. If you have a storage modality, so if you have a monoidal coalgebra modality, then this is an if and only if. You can show that all the linear functions, all the linear maps in your Coclisley category are of this form. And you do that using the co-dereliction. Co 
OK, so some examples. So if you take vec op, where bang is the symmetric algebra, you get that the, cat the Levere theory of polynomials is a subcategory of this Cocleisley category. So you can think of the Cocleisley category as sort of an infinite dimensional thing, Levere theory of polynomials, in a way. Same thing for the C infinity example. You get that smooth, my canonical Cartesian differential category, is a subcategory of that Cocleisley category. And then uh, in this paper, they give some more explicit examples of the co explicitly described examples of the Cocleisley category, specifically the relational model and the finiteness space model. Okay, so first of all, are there any questions about the Cocleisley construction? Yes. Ah, an excellent question. So the Levere theory, the objects for the natural numbers. So you think of these as the finite dimensional vector spaces. The Cocleisley category involves infinite dimensional vector spaces. And you need those infinite dimensional vector spaces because the free symmetric algebra is always infinite dimensional. So that's why it is a larger category than the Levere theory. Does that answer your question? Yes? Shout, speak loudly. All of the things with like the kind of finite dimensional equation have to be Cartesian. Yes, in a way, that's true. But there are compact closed differential categories, but it, that depends how you view compact closed. Either I like to think of compact closed as infinite dimensional in some way, but that's not always true. But yes, usually if your objects are all finite dimensional, then it has to be Cartesian differential. Because bang of v always has an infinite dimensional flavor. OK, so just to now we're going to the home stretch towards the conclusion. So you might be wondering, what about the other direction? How do I go from a Cartesian differential category to a differential category? I'm not going to review this, but I'll give you references. So Blukcock and Seeley, their first attempt at this is called Cartesian differential storage categories. And essentially what this does is it precisely characterizes which Cartesian differential categories are the co cleisley category of a differential category with a storage modality. So that's important. It, ha it had to be a storage modality, which is actually pretty good. I really like the paper. It is a bit of a dense paper, but it's, it's really great. So, um, so that's what storage ca Cartesian differential ca storage categories are. However, there had been an open question, can we sort of have an embedding theorem from Cartesian differential categories into, for any Cartesian differential category, into a different, the co cleisley of a differential category? And the answer is yes. And this, I did this with uh, Richard Gardner, who is also at Macquarie University. And essentially, the theorem is, it's not exactly precise, but here's the theorem. Every Cartesian differential category embeds into the co cleisley category of a differential category. So if you're interested, please go see our paper. Um, it involves the notion of being able to build a category of linear maps and then building the, building the bang from somewhat complicated categorical constructions. But the point is, there's a map going the other way. OK, so what can we do with Cartesian differential categories? So here's a bunch of references. So one thing that I quite like is that you can actually solve differential equations. You can talk about trigonometric functions. You can talk about exponential functions and all that good stuff. You can talk about Jacobians and gradients. So in this paper you asked earlier, and this is the paper where I show that Jacobians and gradients gives you an, sort of an alternative characterization of these things. You can also make precise what linearization means in this category, and that's an important part in Brenda's talk. Um, and as I sort of mentioned, uh, people have picked this up for sort of foundations of automatic differentiation and machine learning, specifically with the notion of reverse differential categories. Uh, I'm not going to talk about reverse differentiation here, but is, it is the hot new thing in differential categories right now. OK, again, most important slide of the talk. We've seen it like five times. So now, for the last five minutes, I'm going to very quickly tell you about these two remaining sections. 
I have five minutes. I'm not going to give you the full definitions, but I will at least give you sort of hopefully enough to sort of pique your interest. Yes, Cole. Does this commute? Does this commute? Some of these. <laughs> okay. Some of these commutes. Some of these are junctions. This is just a, a motivation slide. Um, let's see. This commutes. No. Well, I mean, this is an adjunction. That's an adjunction. I have no idea. Um, interesting. OK, the most important one that commutes is this one. This direction, that direction, is the same thing as the Coclisley arrow direction. So that's the most important one that I would say commutes. Yes? Yes, not only that, the inclusion is precisely the same inclusion of a Coclisley category into the Coeilenberg Moor. It is the exact same functor. It preserves differentiation. All right. So, very, very quickly, differential restriction categories. So, the idea that I said at the start was that differential restriction categories, instead of taking smooth functions, you take partially defined smooth functions. And the way that people do that in category theory is using this notion of restriction categories. It tells you how to talk about partial defined functions. And so essentially, a differential restriction category is a Cartesian, restriction, Cartesian differential category with a restriction operator that's compatible with differentiation. And so the main example is instead of taking smooth functions on Euclidean spaces, you take smooth functions defined on open subsets. Um, any Cartesian differential category is one of these things where every map is totally defined. And then the other direction, you take the category of total functions and you get a Cartesian differential category. That's, that's differential restriction categories in 30 seconds. Okay, tangent categories in like a minute. Uh, if Cartesian differential categories tell you what to do on Euclidean spaces, Tangent categories tell you what, how to do differential calculus on smooth manifolds. And the way this is done is by looking at the tangent bundle. So you abstract this. So you abstract this thing using, uh, you strap all the properties of the tangent bundle functor for smooth manifolds and you generalize it. So in particular, you have the endo functor x, where for every object in your category, t of a is sort of the abstract tangent bundle of a. And so your favorite example should be the category of smooth manifolds. But also, there are other examples, like the category of commutative rings, where T of R is actually the, uh, the ring of dual numbers. So that's the tangent bundle for commutative rings. So this was originally, so this was originally done by Yuri Wazisky back in 1984. And this is Robin's favorite story. This paper had zero citations <laughs> for many years, and it has now become Rosiski's most cited paper. So this hopefully will tell people, young graduate researchers, that sometimes references take a while. But Robin and Jeff picked it up, and tangent categories has arguably, as its own, become its own respected field. OK, so back to my map of differential categories. So every Cartesian differential category is a tangent category. The way this works is while the differential combinator is not a functor, you can use the chain rule to build a functor. And the way it does it is that you do t of f does f of a in the first argument and the derivative in the second argument. Conversely, I'm not going to give the definition, but here's the main idea. The notion of differential objects, which captures Euclidean spaces and Cartesian differential category and tangent categories, give you a Cartesian differential category. And so here's the rough idea that relates tangent categories to differential categories. So, more or less, the opposite category of the co eilenberg moore category of a differential category is a tangent category. In other words, the eilenberg moore category of a co-differential category is a tangent category. If we have enough limits, that sounds scary, but it actually is a very mild condition, the co eilenberg moore category of a differential category is a representable tangent category. 
So essentially, so big picture idea, the co eilenberg mohr category of a tangent category, sorry, the co eilenberg mohr category of a differential category is a tangent category. Big picture idea. So again, most important slide of this tutorial. <laughs> so that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for listening, and merci. OK, so we have time for some questions, if there are any more. And I will try and bring you the microphone before you, yeah. So thank you for your talk. So um, I really liked all your examples that you gave. But for instance, if you're like studying like CCCs or things like that, you can say, oh, but for any uh, pre-shift category, I have a, a CCC structure. And so you can, uh, I mean, you have an infinite amount of uh, examples. And so I think you mentioned the fact that the free exponential gives a differential, right? So I mean, what? What will you uh, say as a, as a nice source of uh, examples of such uh, differential structures? So which, which, which differential structure? Let's say uh, differential categories, for instance. So the, the, the best example we have is free exponential modalities, because the way that I see it is that it, different, so it either differentiates power series or polynomials, which arguably is the simplest non-trivial things that you can differentiate. Um, so that's the best example. Cartesian differential categories, um, so there are two good sources. Either there's the Levere theory source, where you literally build a Levere theory where you can differentiate, or there really is the Cochleisley source. And so, for, and if you take the free exponential modality, you do get the polynomial differentiation. So does that answer your question? OK, thank you. So I, again, have a kind of uh, question about commutativity of uh, some parts of this diagram. So if you start from a Cartesian differential category, you get a differential restriction category, and you can manifold complete it. So th the first question is, uh, if you do this for standard Euclidean spaces, do you get the standard notion of manifolds? Yes. OK. So for that, it, yes. And so the more general question is, if you do this and do take the differential objects, do you get back the same Cartesian differential category that you had at the start? OK, so for that example, yes. Robin, do you know? So my intuition would be that the answer is, if you take, if you do injection, take the manifold completion of a Cartesian differential category, and take mm -hmm. the, the differential objects, I think the answer is yes, Okay. that you do get back just the starting point. Okay. Specifically because the manifold completion does depend on restriction. And if you start with something where everything's total, I would even say that that, that diagram might actually commute on the nose. Because okay. the real thing that you want up above mm -hmm. is the category of smooth functions and open subsets. Yeah. Then then take the manifold completion. Yeah. But um, there's potentially another map that goes from Cartesian differential categories to differential restriction categories which sort of zooms in on open subsets instead. And mm -hmm. potentially, that, that's probably the better answer to your question. OK. Thank you. Any more questions? I don't see. I don't see. OK. All right. In that case, let's thank uh, Jess again. That was really nice.